everybody for joining us today. Um, and it looks like we got every, about 14 people on, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, my name is Sarah Allison, and I'm the Recreation Coordinator with Horse Council BC. And Sandra, Sandra Richards is here um, today with Adventure Smart BC, and she's the Executive Director. And she's going to be presenting um, the Sur Survive Outside webinar um, for us this evening. And I would like to acknowledge that the land where HCBC um, does its work is located on the traditional lands of the Katsi, Kwantlen, Matsqui, and Semiamu First Nations. Um, myself and many others are attending virtually from other areas in the province. And therefore, we'd like to acknowledge all the people um, whose traditional territories we are meeting today. And just some housekeeping before we get started. Um, this presentation is being recorded and will be um, available to watch at a later date. Um, and since we have, oh, we currently have you guys um, unmuted, but if you guys could just keep your mics muted, um, and then if you have a question, just pop it in the chat box. Um, and yeah, we know everybody is busy and it's nice that you guys took this hour out of your busy schedule. So we'll try to aim to keep the presentation to an hour. And just a little bit about the presentation. So BC Search and Rescue Association created the Adventure Smart program to increase awareness for safe activities and practices and to help reduce the number of severity of incidents. And tonight, um, Sandra will go over the three T's, what to do in an emergency, and info on our BC search, uh, BC search and Rescue. And on that note, um, yeah, I'll pass it over to you, Sandra. Thank you, Sarah. I appreciate that welcome, and I'm glad we got figured a few of our tech things out prior to everyone joining us, but I think they saw us do it anyway, so yeah, that's, that's great. That's great. Okay. Well, okay. thank you very much. I'm going to jump into the slide deck, but before I do that, I'd just like to say I'm really grateful to be here with you tonight, uh, have been invited by Sarah and all of you, and that I'm able to play and recreate and work on the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people, specifically for where I am today, uh, is the Tsleil-Waututh First Nation. I have been working with the BC Adventure Smart program for 18 years now, and been involved with search and rescue since I started my career in outdoor, outdoor recreation management since 1994. Uh, Crazy. So I used to be a park ranger with BC Parks, did lots of field work, front country, back country, all realms, um, and, and then had two little people who are now young adults. My son is 24, my daughter is 21, and I've been involved with BC Search and Rescue Association since 2004. The program has really morphed and grown, and it's so exciting to reach different user groups like yourselves tonight. Yeah, so I'm excited to to share with what Sarah shared with me in our presentation, because this presentation is so wonderful. It's really um, massageable and, and adaptable to all different user groups, which makes it applicable to you as riders tonight um, on horseback versus me on my mountain bike. Why don't I jump right in and we can get going. And if there's any questions, I'll do my very best to accommodate you in the dashboard there. But if you could do me a favor, plug them in there and I will go through the presentation and then I'd like to have a peek in there and look at them near the end or maybe you can turn your mic on and ask me no problem I'd like to listen to you as well if we could tonight is our survive at side program this is one of the programs we have underneath our adventure smart umbrella which we have five of uh, as Sarah mentioned the BC search and rescue association is an organization in the province that has a board of directors. I'm one of the, the staff on that crew. Um, a lot of the directors, all of the directors are volunteers. There's only six staff uh, on that team. And we are here to support the 79 search and rescue groups that consist of 3,000 volunteers. And they respond to 1,900 search and rescue calls every year. I manage and coordinate and direct the BC Adventure Smart Program, which is all about outdoor education and incident prevention, which is what we're here to talk about tonight. The program is national based on our provincial success, which is very exciting for us in BC. It's, it's, a, it's a nice feather in our provincial cap. Based on the success of the first five years, Public Safety Canada, the federal government, saw the success of this program in British Columbia and wanted to see it in every province and territory. So there is representation since 2009 in every single province and territory. 
And no matter where you go from coast to coast to coast, these messages you'll hear tonight and this 3T message is consistent. If you're in Newfoundland, you'll hear the same thing. If you're in Atlin, BC, you'll, you'll, you'll hear the same thing. Dofino, you'll, you'll hear the same thing. Anywhere in the country, uh, we say the same thing so that the practices will be consistent, so habits will be created, and that these behaviorals hopefully will be changing in outdoor enthusiasts or introduced to those who it's new to. Uh, trip planning, training, and taking the essentials. If you follow us on social media, you'll see us plaster this wherever we can. Uh, when I'm on the news, I say the same thing, and during presentations, we do it. So we'll talk about these in detail, then what to do in an emergency, and I'll share some information with you that graciously was shared to me by Sarah uh, as a reminder for you, um, for the activities that you choose to do horseback riding. The first T here is trip planning. So no matter if I'm heading out on my mountain bike tomorrow, which I just might do, or if you're heading out for a horseback ride, um, local trails, possibly backcountry, uh, a day, an overnighter, we all have to do this phase. It's essential to making sure that you're safe. It's essential to your group dynamics. Uh, there's a few people involved in this, and we've really summed it up into four little steps here. Uh, planning your travel route and your navigation, no matter what your activity, right? Knowing the terrain and the conditions that you'll be riding in, checking that weather, which is more than just a, a quick peek out the window, and leaving a comprehensive trip plan with a trusted emergency contact. And we'll talk about who that person is and what their role is as we move through. Uh, Sarah, can you chime in and tell me if I'm on, if you're seeing the second page or is it still on the home page? Uh, still on the home page of the presentation. Okay, great. Two seconds. This happened earlier today. Apologies. No worries. And where did that go? She told me about that today. Um, let's go here. You can see it's still paused. One more second. Ah, I did it somehow. Okay. Yeah. There we go. There's this. Thank you. There's those few points about planning, knowing, checking, and leaving. So this is really critical as you as you think about the travel route and the navigation that you'll need for your next horseback ride. Um, knowing the training and the conditions for you and your horse, obviously. Uh, there's more than just me going out for a walk. It's it's you and your horse. There's there's the, at least the two of you to think about checking that weather and leaving this information with a, a trusted emergency contact, which I mentioned we'll talk about in detail in a second. So planning this route is, is key. It's one of the most important phases. You know, we have such wonderful, easy access to outdoor recreation in the province of BC, which is awesome if you know what you're doing. It also gives a false sense of security for those that don't know what they're doing. They think that because there's easy access, it is accessibly doable. It's not gonna be difficult. Things will be fine. Versus when it's a bigger adventure, it takes more time to get there people actually just automatically think a little bit different. So this easy access can, can fool people. Don't let it fool you though. So just deciding on what trail you would choose to do. And I know I have hike in here. This is a common one we use for, for hikers. My apologies there, that didn't get changed, but all of this information applies. Um, you have to base this based on the difficulty of your experience and your ability and the time you have to go for this ride, knowing your limits on the horse and with your group and, and riding within it. Uh, making sure you're checking this estimated time that you're heading out there for this ride. If it's a couple hours, a full day, an overnighter. What's this trail distance? Are you and your party capable, comfortably, safely to do this so that you get back before sunset? If that's your window, if you're not spending a night out there. There's a lot of data collection within the search and rescue community. So every single one of those 1900 calls that happens in BC they have a lot of data entry to do, and that's where it comes back to me that I have access to that. And we use those data-driven insights to figure out what are the causations of search and rescue? How can I better educate the user groups based on me now learning a little bit more about the regions that are playing in and where they need SAR, search and rescue? So the, lo the last bullet there, um, getting lost and disoriented is in the top three reasons for search and rescue in BC. So getting lost and disoriented. The first one is injury. And the last one is exceeding abilities. 
these are three little little extra pieces to think about paying close attention to the trail difficulty no matter if you're hiking biking horseback riding and understanding the physical fitness for you and your horse and how that aligns with the technical difficulty there's a few things in that equation uh, and and these are areas that just to look at as as, as an example right so if, if you're heading out for a a hike let's just use this one because the pictures are indicative we're not riding in that bottom picture some people aren't hiking in that bottom picture but the idea is to look at those finer details so if you're looking up a trail to go for a ride you're going to look at the kilometer distance and the time it might take to do that uh, you're going to figure out what the trail surface is all about and then you'll also check out a, a map that might show elevation gain and distance possibly some contour lines on there too if you have to gain elevation with your animal or your group and how that affects you and the horse. Uh, so if we compare it to Sigurd Peak here, it's only four kilometers longer, but a completely different trail surface. And it's eight hours versus two and a half. And those contour lines, if you know how to read a map, you'll understand how they would look to you if you understand what they mean and how that changes an elevation gain. But it gives you the distance and the elevation gain, which is just below 2000 meters in distance. And there's a reason we're going to talk about that for a sec. It's because we need to check the weather. Again, more than just looking out the window. We all know as we gain elevation, it gets colder. But it almost never fails when subjects are rescued. They're always um, really surprised, even though they know it. They're still surprised, they say, at how dark it is when they're out there overnight. And how cold they got. And how much colder it got throughout the evening. So we're really looking at those temperatures when we go to do an activity and, and here it says it's about to be 90% precip at 6 p.m. So let's wrap up everything by 5.30. My, my idea there. Uh, the likelihood of precipitation gives percentages, the wind speed, precipitation amounts and sunset time. And if you're heading out for a ride on a, on a generally clear day and everything's aligned, uh, the temperatures will decrease by about 10 degrees for every thousand meters. So if now we apply that as the example of Sigurd Peak, let's say you were about to gain almost 2,000 meters on a horse ride with your group. Let's say you're heading for a backcountry ride. You're now losing almost 20, if not 20 degrees in temperature. And as we go through spring, an ugly gray spring where I am anyway, uh, it's definitely noticeable uh, with this cold, damp weather, those temperature changes. And we all see bulbs coming up down at sea level and and lower elevations and we head up and we know it's colder, still some snow, different wet conditions. But if you head up there and there's, a, there's an incident that needs help, that's where you're waiting. That's where you're waiting, where it's that much colder, conditions are that much worse. Your surroundings are not at sea level. So keep that into consideration, the drastic change in, in that temperature. A trusted contact. So you could probably think of someone who you might want to tell before you go for a ride, where you're going, what you're doing, who you're doing it with. Let's think about it in a little bit more detail. Let's figure out who we're going to pick to be this trusted contact and what information we're going to leave. I always like to choose someone who's done these activities with me before so they know what I'm capable of. I do a lot of mountain biking, so I'll, I'll pick someone who I've rode with and let them know where I'm going and when I'm coming back, if I'm not with them, of course. And this is the information, the five W's and the H that I leave behind with this trusted contact. You know, why are you going uh, and the details of the activity, including when, specific information on where, color of clothing. We'll talk about clothing in a sec. Leaving the names and the details of everyone in the party that you're going for a ride with. Everyone's names get left with your emergency contact and details about them. And then state how you're getting to and from the area that you're recreating in. Maybe you're trucking and trailering your horses and yourselves to a different location where you're about to go for a ride in a different area and your trailer and truck are staying at the trailhead. That information is really helpful to search and rescue so that they can really pinpoint where you started, departed from, and headed out on. Uh, it just helps rescuers find you faster. An easy way to do it is a simple text that will work. Uh, you know, you can text someone where you're going and what you're doing, heading out into the mountains tomorrow. Uh, we want to know when, including when you're going and when you plan to be coming back and how that, how that might um, help you to leave this much extra bit of detail. 
and where, give those specifics on where you're going, not just, um, I'm going for a horseback ride in the East Kootenays. <laughs> Way too broad. We need to pin this down. Maybe it's Revelstoke, maybe it's Frisbee Ridge, maybe it's Boulder, maybe it's in Golden, maybe, you know, maybe there's areas where you might be recreating uh, that it needs to be defined in that, that detail. The color of clothing. A lot of us wear darker shades, darker colors, and that's not great for search and rescue for any outdoor recreation. So be sure when you're buying your gear uh, to go riding and anything else you do outside, think of the brighter colors and, and seeing how that would bode well for you if someone needed to find you. Even There's even backpack covers um, and pannier covers that would be a brighter color that would be helpful. And, and then who to leave this, um, pardon me, leaving the details of everyone in your party. So if I'm going for a mountain bike ride with three of us, I'm leaving that detailed information with my boyfriend who's not coming with us. I'm going for a ride with the girls and their information is left there too. And I can do this via text, a note on the fridge, a trailhead selfie, uh, but we also have an app that makes it very easy, which I'll give you access to shortly and it's free. So it's pretty easy to fill in the blanks and send it off to a friend. And then how, how are you getting to and from? If you're taking a car, where is it? And finer details of when you might be back. And if you're not back on time, your emergency contact should try to reach you, of course. If they can't, they can try to reach others in your party. Here we've got John and Chrissy and some phone numbers. No response, and it's 6 p.m. The next instructions are to call 911. And that's key. There is not a special number for search and rescue. And it's really important that uh, everyone remembers this number. There's no charge for search and rescue either. And it needs to go through 911 because the tasking agency anywhere in the province is through the police, RCMP or your municipal police force. And they can get a tasking number and then they call out that local search and rescue group with those specialties. Uh, lots to remember, and I can recite it with my eyes closed, but just extra bits of information to help you. If you forget all that, just remember to call 911 in case there's an emergency. Uh, the next piece I believe is a little video that we have embedded and maybe uh, Sarah, I'll ask you to give me a thumbs up uh, via text that it's working and playing because it shows like it might be playing at my end. So I'm about to click to it and here we go. Great, just a short little video that gives you a chance just to learn a little bit more about the app and I'll give you a chance to access it through a QR code before we're finished tonight, if you haven't already downloaded it. Let's jump into the second T where, where I find it's an exciting piece because this is where we can kind of expand our horizons really and, and it's really important to remember that this is continuous. I'm not sure maybe when some of you started to ride a horse, I. That's not my world of recreation. I've done it a few times. I took my daughter to Pemberton. We went riding uh, a couple of summers ago, but it was a guided tour. It wasn't anything crazy, but we had a great time. So it's not my, my main activity. Uh, but no matter what your activities are and mine, we often know that the, the continuous training happens all the time. And we've broken it into a few categories here. So it's activity skills, specific training. Maybe there's a course that you can take. You could uh, get into the arena and, and get familiar with different um, objects and things that will help your horse be a little bit more in tune um, and desensitized when you get out in the field. Uh, that's a great uh, activity specific skills training. Uh, definitely first aid is, is a big one too, which we'll get to in a second. Physical training, any activity we choose to do outside takes ability, strength, cardio, and keeping fit for that is, is great. I also like to mention that our, our mental strength here is important. If we can think about 
how we might get through a situation and manage risk. Uh, you know, as you plan your next ride with your friends, either virtually on the phone, FaceTime, around the table over dinner, talk about some what ifs. Say, hey, you know, what if Sarah and Sandra and, and my daughter Haley went for a ride? There's a, a group of different experiences there. How, how are we going to handle if Sandra falls off and breaks her ankle? And we're three hours in and we don't have communication. Our, our, our access to communication is limited. Just come up with some scenario to think about what you'll do and kind of assign each other duties. Who's going to be in charge of first aid, maybe who's going to assess the, the area for safety, who, who will be in charge of communications, uh, and, and just talk about it. Just have the conversation, start the conversation and, and see where it goes. Navigation and route finding is key, knowing where to go. It's kind of the first part of our trip planning, as we already discussed about route finding. Wilderness first aid, bushcraft, uh, um, general first aid, any first aid is really helpful for you and your horse. I posted a long time ago about some, you know, so many people hike and go outside with their dogs. And, and what if the dog gets injured or the pads get ripped and torn? I went for a hike years ago on my golden retriever. It was really rough on these sections of rocks and our poor pads got all broken and started to bleed. But, you know, we had a kit with us and we took care of them and rested and, and we ended up turning around. But bringing that first aid kit for you and your your horse, obviously, and then rescue and emergency training. So the training is continuous. It's ongoing. It builds on your skills and abilities and allows you to be more confident out there uh, versus being unaware of how to manage your situation and handle a risky situation or, or an emergency. Training is important to do your homework. It's kind of what we're doing tonight. It's what you started with us uh, tonight about and, and and these are some great tips that I gained from Sarah because I'm not a writer, as I mentioned, but all of this still applies. And I think this fits in quite nicely. You know, she, she had mentioned about getting into the arena um, before you hit the trails and getting familiar and get your, get your horse conditioned and, and, and understanding what they're going to be exposed to. Um, you know, I'm sure it's like us as it is for the horse, we all need to be fit and capable and aware of our surroundings based on the terrain and those conditions, elevation gain, length of the ride. And, um, and then another good one I thought too, which I brought up earlier too, is desensitizing your horse to certain equipments. I've had a few dogs in my years and I remember, you know, getting them used to the vacuum and, and car doors and sounds in the house and in the neighborhood. And it's along the same lines. If you have access to an area where they can be exposed to other entities and equipment that they might run into on the trail, if it's other people on mountain bikes or dirt bikes, um, ATVs, quads, uh, other dogs, uh, bridge crossings, other hikers, big groups, small groups, we all have to get comfortable in these situations. And I guess these are some great, great ways to practice and do your homework in, in a fun way. Taking the essentials this applies to everyone and everywhere you go. And there's basics, there's season and sport specific. And depending on where you ride, we want this to be always along with you, on your person and not on your horse. Um, my boyfriend's a snowmobiler and, and, and we go up in Pemberton sometimes and, and we're always wearing our, our essential gear on us. There's nothing that, you know, if we got separated from our snowmobiles, we have what we need to take care of each other in the situation. And the same would go uh, with you for riding a horse. So that's really important to think about what the basics are. And then of course there's season and sport specific gear that you might bring for you for your next ride as I do on my mountain bike. Now, my pack is slightly different than my pack for snowmobiling, snowshoeing, micro spiking or hiking as it is for, for uh, other activities that I do. Uh, so let's jump into the basics because this applies to you on a, on a horse and me on my mountain bike. Some people often, when they meet us at trailheads, if we're set up there or at an event, uh, they say, oh man, it seems so much to carry and wear, um, and, and I don't know where I'm gonna find it all. I bet you have a good chunk of this at home already, and it's easy to source, actually. So some form of light source, and don't forget the extra batteries. I love to go hands-free and use a headlamp. Uh, it allows you to cook, uh, first aid, um, walk with your, your hiking poles or a ride. It, you know, the headlamps are awesome. A fire starting kit and knowing how to use it. A great fire starter is all the lint from your dryer. You're taking it out because it's a fire hazard. Pack it in a neat little zippy and there's a form of a fire starter. Signaling device could be a, a loud safety whistle. It can be a, a shiny 
old CD or a disc uh, and, and some form of signaling device so that someone can hear or see you. A first aid kit and pocket knife that applies to all sorts of applications, sun protection and emergency blanket. We have a little red sock there and we stop there for a second, which will continue, but it all fits in that neat little red pouch there that's at the top of the left uh, in that picture. And then the extra food and water, clothing, nav and communication is also easy to pack and carry and, uh, and wear at times with those extra layers. So those are the basics. That's what goes every single time. Uh, no matter how big or small your adventure is, no matter how many people are in your group, you're all carrying these and it's taken. And then you add to it season and sport specific. There's just an example. If I was going to go for a hike, then there'd be some micro spikes along with, the, with that easily at this time of year. Still lots of snow up top. Um, this is just an example. There's, there's definitely more to this. Let's say you're going for a multi-day ride. The essentials top left in that box stay the same. Uh, and, and again, and this is just a, an introduction to some of the other extras. So obviously, tent, sleeping bag. Um, we've got a uh, bowl. We've got a little stove. We've got food. We have some gel packs, banana, kind bars. Again, basics, extra clothing, uh, just so that you can start to think about those extra season and sport specific pieces. And let's say if you're going to head for a climb, I don't know if you horseback ride to go climbing. If you can be so lucky and uh, these are the extra pieces of gear you could bring for that as well and you know don't forget about just another piece there if you do any winter travel we've got transceiver shovel probe and also don't forget those personal extras i have to wear glasses now all the time so um, not to write or anything but if i want to look at anything for too long on my phone there's a, an extra pair of glasses now in my pack or my favorite trail mix is essential to me or dark chocolate uh, and maybe there's medication, maybe you have a puffer, uh, whatever might be essential for you for any time. Don't forget to pack those as well. Here we get into what I consider a really important piece. The other pieces are key, um, but what we find is that 1900 times a year in BC, and, and right now currently we're over 2000, people aren't as sure as they should be in what to do in an emergency. Uh, so we've broken it down so it's digestible into the stop analogy. We need you to stop, think, observe, plan. That's it. And it's really no different than if you have any children and you're interested, we have a Hug a Tree and Survive program. It's for kids K to 6. And it really tells the kids to hug a tree and stay put. It's the same premise. We're just getting them to stop and we're telling you to stop. It's no different. As, as you move around, there's more hazards. There's more danger. Uh, inevitably it turns into something more dire and at times doesn't turn out to be a successful um, incident. So by stopping, you're already doing something better than anything else. Uh, it's taking you a chance to assess the situation, giving you a chance to assess, is anyone hurt? Why have we, what's the emergency? Let's think about this for a second. Do we need extra additional emergency care? Uh, are we lost? turned around? Do we just get off the trail? Do we just need to kind of get all the horses and everyone in the group back on track, back on trail and continue? Did someone just get astray? Uh, so these are great things to think about in that first phase of stopping. Uh, on average, there's about five search and rescue calls a day in BC. And, and the, the 3,000 volunteers, about 2,500 of them are full-time, 500 are members in training or MITs. Uh, and they're all busy, busy people, all volunteers, all unpaid professionals. So if you think about five search and rescue calls a day, these volunteers are leaving their family, their friends, birthdays, dinners, Christmases, Thanksgivings, work, uh, and, and they're coming to help you. So if we can reduce the number of that call at all, that's success. If it still happens, but we can reduce the severity of that call, that is also success. So let's see what happens when we think. We're gonna think about a few things and how will you contact search and rescue? Will you have your communication device, which is um, primarily, your primary piece of comms would be a spot, an inReach or a Zolio. Your phone is your secondary communication device. Do not rely on that for reception. Don't rely on it for anything but taking pictures. If you just go in with that mindset, you'll be ahead of the game. And the investment in another communications device will be worth its weight in gold. Will anyone know you're missing? Absolutely, there's a, there's a few answers here that are yes, because you filed a trip plan with your contact. Will anyone know where you are? You left all of that detail, remember back in the, in the trip planning phase? 
with your contact so they know all these finer bits and who's with you? Um, and when should you call search and rescue? Uh, some people think it's an hour, some people think it should be two, some people think you should try to figure this out yourself. Uh, but the idea when to call is, is as soon as possible. If you can make that phone call right away, it will allow search and rescue to be notified through the police for them to leave their family, friends, activities, whatever they're doing, uh, gather their gear, which is pretty much ready to go, but they still have to collect it wherever it is, in the car, the truck, the, the, the mudroom, uh, and get to either the, the trail, um, to their SAR hall, to the command truck, wherever they need to go. So there's time that needs to be had to, for them to get ready. And then they assess the situation for themselves. Is it safe for them to go in? Uh, is there thunder and lightning? Is it, is it not safe for them to go in? Is there an avalanche? Uh, is it avalanche conditions too high? Is it not safe for them to go in? Swift water conditions? Um, many, many reasons why they have to assess to make sure it's safe. And when it's safe for them, then they will come and look for you. So don't delay. Back to that point, phone ASAP. Are you prepared to treat a medical emergency? You've taken your first aid, maybe bushcraft, wilderness first aid, so you can take care of your friend here. Uh, and and ho or hopefully they can take care of you based on the training that you've taken to be prepared for this. And do you have the essentials to keep warm and dry? You pack them all, they're in your pack. Now you get to pull out those layers and put on that extra puffy and put on that hat. Um, maybe put on an extra pair of socks or change your socks if need be. Have a little snack, have a drink and, and create some uh, heat and regulate that uh, really, really efficiently. There again, 911 and search and rescue is free of charge. For anyone uh, in BC who needs it. Let's just do a little map of the provinces here, Alberta to BC. If we look at Alberta, you'll see that there's that beautiful mauve color. That's where we do have reception over there. If we come back to British Columbia, which I can see some of you are from South Cowichan, I see a Victoria, I see a Prince George, just to pick a few out of the there. Thanks for letting me know. Figure out where you are on that map in BC and see where there is that mauve color close to you or not close to you. We have a few corridors where it's it's doable, but a good chunk of our province is limited, limited reception and communications. And that's why we don't rely on this as our primary. So I know we'll take it, I, we all do, pictures and just in case there's reception, uh, but it's not our main piece of comms by any means. It's definitely not the primary. Now our observations, we're start, starting to look around for hazards. Uh, is it safe to be where we are, where we stopped? Uh, and look around to see if it's safe here to make a shelter. And only if you can see a clearing, an open clearing from where you've stopped, that would be a good spot to make signals for a helicopter coming overhead. You can make big SOS in the ground, big X's, three X's in a row. Um, lay down and make yourself do a snow angel on the ground and, and uh, let someone see you that way. And so there's ways to make yourself visible. But don't go searching far and wide for a clearing, only if it's close to where you are. And now you get to plan. You've got more essentials in your pack because you pack them and also your personals. Plan how you'll use them in this emergency. Uh, build your essentials, uh, pardon me, use your essentials to build your shelter. I'll show you a picture of a great one coming up. And that can go back to bushcraft if you've taken any or you've been mentored growing up and, and you know how to make a lean to. So here's your chance to shine and make it make it worth your while. Build that fire if you know how to manage it safely and control it safely. And wear those extra pieces of clothing, like I mentioned earlier. That last bullet there at the bottom of this slide, the average time for a search and rescue call in British Columbia, if you take them all into consideration, the average time is eight hours. And most times search and rescue calls come in before sunset, just before sunset, doesn't matter what time of year it is, <laughs> more than not, it's just before sunset. And then uh, there's at least an eight hour wait. So imagine summertime, sunsets about 9, 30, 10, when it's great, great sunny to as late as it can be. Uh, and then let's say nine o'clock, someone falls off their horse and breaks their wrist because they've had a full day, they're tired, they're exhausted, the horse gets spooked down you go um, and now you're assessing and managing your risk and SAR can't reach you till four or 5 a.m. for whatever reason. Some calls are much faster than that, not here to scare you, and some are much longer. 
though, uh, depending on where this happens in the province. Down on the southwest here, there's easy access to a lot of the subjects that need help, so calls can be much less than eight hours. And let's go way up in the north. Uh, you know, we've got a few people here from the north that uh, can attest to calls can be had for foragers, mushroom pickers, ATV, quarters, horseback riders, hunters, and they could be one or two weeks long. So the average back to that point is, is eight hours. And, and would you be able to wait safely for that long? Keeping warm and dry is critical. Think about the layering system and, and wearing these synthetic layers, not cotton. And you're wearing these layers to regulate your body temperature, your base layers, um, a thermal or synthetic. It's nice and close to your body, wicking away that moisture as you get hot and sweaty for a big, fast, adventurous ride. You want to be dry. The next layer is a thermal, will keep you uh, regulated with that temperature. And then the outer protects you from the wind, the rain, the sleet, the snow, everything that's coming at you. And there's usually pit zips where you can regulate even better. Those three layers can get you through uh, pretty much anything if they're the right material. Fire is a great one yeah, for mental well being, for first aid if we need to take care of someone and keep them warm, for cooking around and, and making sure we know how to do that with a with a kit we have in our pack so you're bringing you're bringing the whole kit no joke no pun intended kit and caboodle together for you to make this and then the shelter here's a great little lean to um uh, a couple emergency shelters there nice little fire to reflect some heat in they've got it up against the tree branches and bows floor and fauna on the top to create a bit of a roof uh, which would create some barriers there to, to reflect and keep some heat flowing through that that area. Imagine maybe some of you have been in a helicopter, um, and I have too with work and, and such. This is what it looks like from the view of a search and rescue volunteer looking down below the skids uh, of, a, of a helicopter. So we as subjects that might need rescuing need to think as big as possible, as contrasting as possible. Those bright colors, like I mentioned earlier, leaving clues, being heard, being seen. However we can do this, because it's easy to see how everything could just blend together there and, and really just all collide into one big mishmash and make it very difficult to see, especially if we're in browns and greens and earth tones and blacks. It would be, it's hard to pick someone out. So think of as much contrast as you possibly can. A couple more slides and then, uh, and then I can answer any questions, hopefully, if there's any. Um, as we conclude, let's not forget about these three T's. This is really the crutch of everything. It's, it's where you can go to each section and think, oh, how can I work on my trip planning? Bring your friends together, plan it out. Um, you can use the Adventure Smart Trip Plan app and that will give you easy ways to fill in the fields and send it off to a friend. Uh, that's easy. What training can I take to build on my skills and experiences? Have some fun with your training, do it with a group of friends. And, and you'll be more confident and comfortable for your next adventure. And always, 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 always take those essentials with you and pack the extra season and sport specific pieces of gear. Um, I think we all know how to do this, but you can take your phone and go to the camera setting, go right over that QR code and it will access you to our trip plan app. If you haven't already, we really encourage you to follow us over on um, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. We have regular events there, messaging, uh, training opportunities. If anyone's interested in joining us and becoming a volunteer educator with us, we have a, an event on May 18th that you could join and uh, that can be found on our Facebook events page. And that's a great way just to share messages like this in your community to user groups if you choose to. But a big thank you from our team here, which tonight is just me, uh, to all of you for joining me and Sarah for inviting me. and and. Uh, Hopefully that gives you some framework to work off of and apply to what you like to do out there um, with your friends and family and, and all the best for your for your horseback rides this summer and, and where you'll ever be traveling, which sounds like it should be a good time. So uh, that concludes the Survive Outside program. Uh, and thanks for joining us. And, and if there's anything else we can do for you before after tonight's over, don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, just DM us on any of our socials and, and we'll get back to you and happy to help here. You should be able to, if you wanted to, I believe, unmute and ask a question, or you can put it into the question field or the chat field. Uh, Sarah, you're welcome to come back on as well if you'd like. And I can take any questions if I can manage them smoothly through here. 
Again, I don't have tech support tonight. Oh, you're welcome, Erica. Thank you. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you. We see, I see Surrey, Victoria, South Cowagin, Courtney, PG, uh, and Quinnell. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much for that, Sandra. That was really informative and um, yeah, great presentation. Um, are you seeing any questions come through from anybody? Or? I don't see anything here. Oh, I do see one. Let's just see what it says. Does the website have the children's safety course? It does. So if you go to adventuresmart.ca uh, and then in the top banner, you're going to see a section that says programs. Hit that and then you'll see the list. You'll see this program. Uh, and in there, you'll also see Hug a Tree and Survive. It'll, it'll describe everything in there, what it's about. It's for kindergarten to grade sixers. And if you scroll down there, there's even a video you could watch with your family. If you've got little ones in your house, you can watch that with them. It gives you a really good story. It ends positively, but there's a few lessons learned. And if you want us to deliver that presentation or any of our educators too, you can scroll to the bottom of that page, request a presentation. And in British Columbia, it'll come to me and uh, I can coordinate a, an educator for you. Thanks for that question, Debbie. Nice. I don't see any, any, any other questions there, Sarah, so far, but I, had, I did end a, a couple minutes early, but not too early, five minutes sooner than I thought I would, but. Okay, no worries. All right, well, maybe we'll just give people just a, another minute, just in case they're oh, typing away or something. Um, <laughs> with what they have. And um, yeah, on your Facebook page as well, you list um, kind of your events and everything that are coming up throughout the summer too, right? Because um, you do host some more free webinars and everything. We do, this time of year is usually when we're queuing up for summer. So it's it's a little bit quiet right now in that list because we're creating the list. And, and so uh, spring and fall are usually when I'm the busiest with our team here so that we can actually create everything for the summer and winter and and offer yeah there'll be some webinars coming up some special events you can also go to our adventure smart youtube and and check out some events that we've already done we've got some great ones about communication and technology on march 1st just this past um, march we did lost person behavior which was really exciting we had the author of lost person behavior come on talk to us oh, about nice. that we had we had over five thousand people register for that that was kind of crazy oh wow uh, so adventure smart youtube there's a few more resources there that if you care to watch oh perfect okay yeah i'll have to look that up and share that with everybody as well yeah awesome, awesome. Um, oh i see thank you you're welcome carol uh has searching by the drones made a difference great question uh tara Terra. sorry if i mispronounced that you know certain areas of the province um, have access to drone operators and certain areas of the province don't have access you know we can't just go willingly and fly them in the parks uh provincial or national uh we just created some new videos that we're launching on april 25th for four weeks and they're the highest search and rescue call volume trails in the province and we went out with drones but we had to get a permit uh, to go out and film in these areas so um they aren't used 100% across the board yet in search and rescue. There's still a lot of standard operating procedures that need to get looked at and make sure that it's it's um, safe and um, legal to do so in certain parts. So it's not right across the board just yet, but that's a great question. Uh, Debbie says, my daughter works after school at daycare, so it would be good if they are in Penticton and Naramata. If we are or they are, so it would be good as they're, oh, they're welcome to join. If so, she works at the daycare, if I understand that right, Debbie. If she works at the daycare and she would like to be um, an educator with us, she's welcome to join on May 18th. And then she can deliver the hug a tree and survive to the little ones at daycare. I remember when my daughter was little, I did that too. It was great fun. You just make it really simple for them to mm -hmm. absorb. Mm -hmm. oh, thanks, so pass it on. Great, wonderful, super. Nice. Well, it's nice to see a few things coming through. That's awesome. Yeah, don't forget to download the, the Trip Plan app. It's so easy to use. I, I create, um, personally, I just create, let's say, four activities, um, sledding, hiking, mountain biking, and hiking. 
And then when I go back to do those activities again and again, I don't create a whole new one. I just go to the last one I created and I just edit it. So I'm not having to go in and create a whole other thing again because my essentials will stay the same. I often ride the same trails. Uh, I often use the same emergency contact. I just have to change the date, um, maybe a few little things. And then I send that off to my contact. And I also send a text to myself. I send the trip plan to me as well. So that when I get back, let's say I'm back, I'm showering, getting ready to go out, and I forgot to hit trip completed by the time it will notify my contact and me at the same time mm -hmm. so if i said i'll be back by five and i'm driving let's say or i'm just getting out of the car and it's i forgot to do that it texts me and my friend as contact so i can be like oh yeah trip completed and then i say ah, sarah i'm fine don't worry about it but we'll both get notifications and i do that to remind myself in case i forget to hit trip complete um, just a little trick for that mm -hmm. if anyone's going to use the app um, yes, to teach the kids on how to use the forest and keep safe. Perfect, Debbie. It sounds like it should work out fine. Awesome. Do you have a recommended communication device on your website, iSpot? Yes. If you go to, I'll talk you through this. Give me two seconds. Uh, super easy. It's easier for me to pull it up on my phone and I'll talk you through it. So if you're on the website now at adventuresmart.ca, uh, you can hit the dashboard. And if you go under safety, and then if you scroll down to communication and signaling, you'll have an opportunity to learn more about different comms, uh, different devices, and there'll be a section that says read our brochure, view the PDF. I would click on that and check out what that says, a little bit more detail about Spot, Reach, Solio, or the few that I recommend. And here's where I would really suggest if you had more time, queue it up for another day, watch it on demand. Go to our Adventure Smart YouTube channel, look up the special event that we just did in February, and it's called Communications and Technology, Comms and Tech. We had two search and rescue volunteers who are on our tech committee uh, join us as special guests. I was just the MC, and then I just sat back and watched and listened. Uh, mm -hmm. And then we also had a SAR volunteer join us from Galileo um, in Belgium and from their search and rescue group. All three of them subject matter experts in their own right they will definitely entertain you if you're interested in anything to do with communication good debbie says many go to the Ketty kettle valley trails and it would be good yeah that's a great spot wonderful spot to go yeah i have friends who live in naramata we visit them regularly it's a great spot to ride up up above my friend's house and all through those areas lovely so many places to explore with our families. So it's nice that we have the programs for the children. It's nice that we have this program that's adaptable to horseback riders, mountain bikers. Uh, we have a version of this, if any of you spend time on the snow. Uh, we have a snow safety education backcountry program that is awesome for anyone on micro spikes, split boards, backcountry skiing, uh, snowshoeing. And it jumps into a little bit of avalanche awareness. Basic, trust me, basic, basic. Your skills training comes from Avalanche Canada. But we just talked to you about where you can get that training, who your providers are, that you need to be taking your transceiver shovel and probe and getting the training for that. So if winter's of interest as well, we have programs too. Wonderful. Well, great group of questions there. Nice to see everybody chime in. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, those are some great questions. Anything else coming through? Or? Nope, Debbie was the last one. Oh, I see Marianne here. I can, this is so small. I need my, I need the other glasses to read the small <laughs> dashboard. This is absolutely ridiculous how tiny this is. Sorry for me leaning in. Uh, I can possibly help with the training, some horseback riders. Oh, wonderful, that's great, Marianne. I have been in charge of training and mounted SAR, perfect. Um, and with Princeton GSAR, okay, wonderful, awesome. Okay, you sound like a perfect candidate, Marianne, for May 18th to join us and uh and cue in that night it's a couple of hours of me <laughs> sorry but it is uh I, I entertain you as much as i can and we'll go over the delivery of this program more in the generic sense not horseback riding but just the three t's general sop survive outside we'll jump into the hug tree and survive we'll talk about consistent social media messaging and and how to 
get this message out there consistently and, and share it um, with all of our resources. And we supply you with everything after you're done the training. You get slide decks and resources. And if you're a SAR volunteer, uh, then you do have access through the Search and Rescue Volunteers Association of Canada for whistles and shelters and coloring books for the kids. It's great. So May 18th, if that's of interest, you can register on the Facebook uh, link. Perfect. Yeah, it is exciting that we have a um, equestrian search and rescue team now and a mounted SAR team. So that's very exciting that's for the purpose. Pretty cool. Yeah. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so, and I pardon me if I'm pronouncing this again wrong. Terry, maybe it's Terry, um, asks, do we recommend what three words? I think is what you're suggesting. You wrote what four words? I think it's what three words. Um, the short answer is no. And I'm really good at long answers, but I'll try to keep it short. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't we don't recommend what three words the, the, the simple Latin long that you can provide for um, RCMP police or search and rescue is is what they want from you if you're so fortunate that there's reception in the area that you're in and you can communicate with your phone with a search and rescue volunteer because they will try if they can if they can get you it's better off and easier for them so if they can communicate with you and you're good to go perfect you can give location they can pin your phone they can they can do all sorts of things to find what your latin long is if you know where your compass is on your phone you can also tell them what your latin long is on your phone you can text it to them you can also provide that through your gps unit you can uh, offer this information that's the system that they're versed in that they're clearly legible in and trained in and there's no wrong or there's only one Latin long from where you are, right? Uh, so what three words is um, not encouraged to use, definitely not encouraged to use. And some entities use it. It is a tool out there, but from a search and rescue community, um, there's simpler ways to do that. You're leaving a trip plan with a friend or family. All the details are there. You know that you have to contact 911 to initiate that task to police, which goes to search and rescue, which then comes and finds you. So there's no one else involved in that communication circle, none. So that's a system that they've promoted and that we encourage everyone to use as well. Good question, I haven't heard that question in a long time. Great one. Thanks for challenging me on it too. Okay, I will try, this is Marion. I have some clinics going on at the same time. Ah, yeah. And you know, we put these on, I do an intake for those educators every spring and fall. So if it doesn't work out this spring to join us as an educator, I'll do it again in the fall. And again, we put it all on our socials when we're doing training and um, promote it. And so I just do two intakes a year, which is enough. We have over 500 volunteer educators in BC that have joined our contingency as educators. So it, for the response, there's 3000. For educators, we have 500 that are trained. Some are search and rescue volunteers, some are teachers, some are guides, some are backcountry leaders, uh, tourism representatives, um, professors at university. Uh, so we'd love to have some uh, horseback riders in there too to add to our array of educators so you can help reach your own community <laughs> a little bit more. Yeah, that's amazing. That's a, that's a big number for <laughs> educators in BC, that's awesome. It is. It's exciting to see, right? And then, so anyone who goes to the website and let's say someone tonight goes in and books the Hug a Tree and Survive program in British Columbia, it'll come to me and then I can pick out of those 500 from where the request came from. Let's mm -hmm. say it's in PG. Uh, and then I look through my volunteers in Prince George and say, hey, Trent, can you go and deliver this presentation to so-and-so on the date? And then he says yes or no and so it allows us to be spread all over the place and reach um mm -hmm. take care of the demand yeah that's perfect that's great right. well i believe that's all the questions sarah sarah i'm glad a few came in and i was i was glad to answer those for everybody yeah that's awesome all right well yeah i'll just kind of finish off here so um yeah thank you everybody for attending the presentation tonight um we hope you gained some insight on how to be prepared when you and your horse hit the trails and uh, what to do in an emergency 
And yeah, thank you, Sandra, so much for taking the time to present. And a big thank you to all the search and rescue teams out there as well, that if we ever get in a sticky situation, they'll be there to help. So that's awesome. And yeah, thank you, everybody, for taking the time out of your busy schedules um, to join us tonight. Yeah, so have a good evening, everybody. Thanks. Wonderful. Good night. Take care. Good night. Bye.